welcome to tonight's episode, the, or today's episode of the Group Therapy Podcast. Today we have returning guest Sean Burkett and Ryan Stacy from the, uh, I want to say the cult hit, uh, uh, the 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 two parts of a trilogy. Fingers crossed on uh, <laughs> don't, don't Buck in the woods. <laughs> um, I, I told you I was like, yeah, I was like, I had somebody come up to me the other day, and he goes, man, he goes. You know, there's a movie on Tubi called, you know, Don't Fuck in the Woods. I went, know it. I know the guys that made it. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, man, Ryan, it says that your microphone is not on. It's giving you a heads up. But, uh, all right. So, you guys have. I know my phone, my microphone is off. I'm in the same house as Sean. So, uh, I'm trying to eliminate as much feedback as I can because I'm like 20 feet away from him so okay that'll work then cool um so you two have a pair of cryptid centric movies coming out uh tell us about them Ryan you can take this one no <laughs> why me I'm not the director okay so, uh, we have uh, Project Mothman, which is literally for the past uh, about a year and a half, we've kind of been filming this in secret, just uh, in between all our other productions, whenever we get a chance. Uh, and it is basically a, I guess, a mockumentary. I hate that word because... Like, literally, like, everything, all the information in it is real. All the information that we gather is real. Uh, so, yeah, but we, we go to Point Pleasant and we uh, document uh, past and and present sightings of of Mothman. And, well, thing, things take a turn in the end. So, it uh, it's definitely like a documentary that turns into something a little more found footage. All right. So what's funny yeah. is, there we go, switching around here. Um, I am a, a big cryptid guy. I, I love my cryptids. And this will be your third, three attempt, because you did, you know, you have a Sasquatch. Now you've got a Mothman and you've got the Jersey Devil coming. So, um, well, see, technically the creature, technically the creature in Don't Fuck in the Woods could be categorized as a cryptid. There we go. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. The, um, well, the funny part about it is, is you guys, did you guys actually go to Point Pleasance to film anything? Yeah. Cool. Um, we got into the, uh, the Mothman Museum, they let us in there after hours for a little bit. And, uh, I mean, we went all around the town. We went to the bunkers. Those bunkers, it's like living in 3D. Like, the 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 way that the audio is in there, it is the craziest thing. This may be underwhelming, but it's the craziest thing I've experienced, like, in real life. Well, it's the, is it the shape of the, of the, because I know they're domes, right? And it's just the yeah. way the sound permeates. Yeah, I, I could definitely yeah. see that. And uh, <clears throat> uh, last year, uh, Tina and I went to a horror convention in Virginia. We drove through Point Pleasance and my wife's a big uh, uh, Fallout fan. So she had to go see where they filmed, <laughs> where the Fallout took place. She, she, I was like, well, this is Point Pleasance. This is. <laughs> and, and then on our way back through we drove through and it was like i don't know um it was early in the morning and um they have the sign up that says uh uh rest area uh point pleasant rest area restroom uh or rest area closed and my wife's going wonder why that is because they don't need the mothman sneaking up behind you while you're at the air <laughs> <laughs> but uh no it's it's <sighs> I think it's it's really cool you guys have been able to go to Point Pleasant. You're doing a 
mockumentary. Um, I, I wouldn't say it, it's it's a documentary that becomes found footage. Is what right, it is, like, right. Yeah. So it's not a mockumentary. It's it's a it's it's an actual documentary that becomes a full another movie at a certain point. Essentially, essentially, right. Yes, because well, when it becomes more found footage and things become more storyline driven yeah it, it it's like one night after we've done all our interviews and everything it it doesn't have anything to do with you know the history or anything like that it's like we gather the information and then it kind of just changes from there okay because no. like i don't i don't want to discredit anyone or anything any sightings anything like that and I, I actually mentioned that in what we've shot already because there's been you know I, I i get to be a research nerd when it comes to like cryptids and it's like i don't want to like say like this this seems funny this seems funny but it's like there's some people um one of the the first people to have a uh encounter was uh Linda Scarsberry Scarberry and she ended up having uh a total of three one where Mothman even like dove out of a tree and tried to get her in her front yard uh so there's there's some things that we definitely touch base on that I feel from what I've, because I've seen every documentary on Mothman, and it's like, I feel like there's always just this little bit that they either don't touch, or at that point it will make, I don't know, the documentary like turn a little bit, like shift, like it might not be a real thing. Because a lot of the documentaries I've watched are like, I, I feel like, other than the small town monsters, like their documentaries are amazing, but like the other ones, I feel like they're trying to sell a sense of realism and not show you both sides. Yeah. So, yeah. well, there, there's no money in, in making it out to be a, con you know, proven that it doesn't exist. The money's in making it proven that it does exist or trying right. to prove that it does exist. Right. Yeah. The um, um, a friend of mine is actually in the documentary uh, Eyes of the Mothman. So, yeah. Chad Lambert. Okay. Yeah, he did. He, he worked on that one. I actually got a signed copy of it around here from him. <laughs> so, um, well, so are you are you a big cryptid guy? Are you are you really into the cryptids or is it just something you kind of settled on with with uh, these movies? I don't know. I don't, I mean, I say I don't know. I'm sitting like 10 feet away from like Bigfoot casts. And uh, so it's like, I think I've, since Don't Fuck in the Woods, like getting into making monster movies, I think I've become more of a cryptid uh, advocator, if that's even a word. Yeah. I mean uh, it is now yeah. <laughs> yeah it is now advocate that's what i was looking for advocate uh Ryan just mm -hmm. they're just fun they're just fun like i can do research on it but then i can also choose to, to do whatever the hell i want to do so, so ryan where do you stand on cryptids Oh. No. Nope, we're not getting any sound. Oh, there we go. Back there. Okay. Okay. So there where do go. I stand on cryptids? I don't actually have a position. Um I guess I've always thought that there could be possibilities of these things existing. Um I know when I was a little kid, I was always fascinated by Bigfoot. 
just the idea of it. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of where I'm at with it. Like I don't, I don't not believe and I'm not like a, an advocator apparently. So yeah, advocate. no, for me, I, I I've talked about this cause I, I did, I actually got Ken Gerhardt on the show. If, if you've ever seen any documentary about cryptids or, or Bigfoot and stuff, you've seen Ken Gerhardt on that. And we had a talk. We actually talked somewhat off camera and, um, and we were talking about, you know, our own personal experiences and stuff like that. We had talked before and I was like, I not saying I seen the Ohio grass man, but I think I saw him twice. <laughs> If not, it's it's really coincidental. It's legitimately on the same river, and it's about six miles apart. And I saw a hairy, short dude, like, getting water out of the river with his hands and disappearing back into the woods. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's a thing. And then uh, I think I saw a Thunderbird once. And not the car, the actual big bird. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I almost wrecked my car trying to get my phone out of my pocket to take a picture of it. Cause I didn't, I thought it was a, I thought it was a prop for Halloween. This is literally yeah. like two weeks before Halloween. I'm driving to Lima cause I worked at the Lima mall at the time. And I see this big bird on a pole and I'm like, that's a really good prop. Somebody did a really good job. And then it spreads its wings out, kind of shakes and then puts its wings back in. And I'm like, that's not a prop. And the whole entire time I'm like, <laughs> doing about 70 on the, doing probably about 80 on the interstate going, I'm going to try to take a picture with my phone. And that wasn't the good phone either that I could like this one. I could do now. That was the flip open, scroll, hit the, <laughs> back when I still had a Nokia. <laughs> then if I would have wrecked, the only thing they would have found was the Nokia phone. <laughs> right. So, so Ryan, what are you working on this uh, on these two movies? What's your job? Uh, currently? I am an actor, I'm one of the characters in the back half of the Mothman Project. It, it, it's it's I'm not gonna lie, it's kind of weird having you in front of the camera instead of behind the camera. Have you watched a lot of our movies, Paul? Yes, but it's still. <laughs> I'm in several. <laughs> I know, but it, it's it's you know that you're you're now just the full actor in this one. But um, so, I mean, it's weird for me because I've not acted in this capacity before, so it should be pretty challenging and fun. And I like the people we get to do this with, and we get to go to this place that Sean has found. Um, I said yes before. I. Um, learned that I, this would require me to go to Point Pleasant. So I got hoodwinked. <laughs> that and the bunkers at night. Yeah. Yeah, that's You're bullshit. Night? You never bullshit. told me that until after. And it wasn't even to me. You were telling somebody else and I found out secondhand. So we. They were over here going, we're going to the bunker. What time? I don't know. Yeah. Like 10 o'clock. You're like, the hell we are. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It was pretty similar to that. Surprise. Yes. So did anybody have any experiences while you were there? You know what? I've, I've been in some places to where, like, I get a vibe, like, the hair stands on the back of my neck. Not a single thing in Point Pleasant. Like, it was just... It's weird as you didn't catch anything there when we were doing the location scouting for trespassing. You caught something growling at you from under the stairs. Right, but also in that in that house, like I knew, like that that back area. I was like, no, nah, there's something wrong back there. But I'm not going back there. Mm -hmm. Man. So like, yeah, I've been in some places to where it's like. I'll just have a bad vibe, but everywhere in Point Pleasant, like, 
going into the the bunkers and everything the bunkers like you know i didn't feel like i was going to be hurt or anything but it's a this like 3d sound is a weird sensation on your ears to where it's like ooh but no i it was great i'm sure i'll feel different at night because i'm terrified of the dark but that's bad. A dude make, that makes horror movies terrified of the dark. I am. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm the exact opposite. It can't get dark enough, man. I'm I'm if I I turn all the lights off here in the basement, I, I still like it. I need to get a little bit darker. Just <laughs> the computer, yeah. the little light on the computer is too bright. Shut it off. No. <laughs> I've gotten better like in places, but like you gotta think, I've spent like a decade out in the woods making movies and at night, like so the things that are in my head are scarier than anything that could be out there That's the but with, with I still if I'm walking alone at night in the woods, a werewolf is in my head coming <laughs> out and gonna tear my face off See I, I, I've been one of these kids that I, I lived in the woods when I was a kid. And so I had no fear of any of that stuff. But then you find something in the woods that you're just like, okay, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> Shoot. I, I remember being a kid and finding an abandoned campsite in the middle of the woods. And like part of the stuff had been burnt. And one of the things that had been burnt was a book, like a paperback book, but it was in Cyrillic. So it was Russian. And I'm just like, I don't think we're supposed to be here. <laughs> and me and my two friends were like, I think we need to leave. Right. <laughs> Nothing, no animals, no, no, no monsters, just creepy, weird, real people are the scariest things that lurk in the woods. <laughs> By the way, that's the name of my new movie, Creepy Weird People That Lurk. <laughs> well, and that's kind of what uh, The Devil You Know, the second film in the fundraiser is about. Um, essentially, it's about a, a cult attempting to finish a ritual that was started 40 years before. Um, but it's also, at that point, like a home invasion movie. So it's that one is definitely based more in reality. Like, you know, no monsters in the woods. Yeah. Well, there are monsters. They're just human <laughs> monsters. Right. <laughs> I I I am I'm a firm believer that 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 the the human monster is far scarier than any monster monster, I guess. Because you know your brain's always like, Bigfoot could be, might be, it could be real, but that dude over there, weird looking dude over there, that's real. <laughs> right. Yeah. <coughs> so, so what made you decide to do the two movies simultaneously that you're working on right now? Or well, it came. It came down to. Um, we needed some finishing funds for Project Mothman. And I have this script and probably for the last few months, I've been showing it to people looking for investors. And what's kind of weird is that these investors were like, well, but it's not a creature feature. So it's like, this is more of a thriller slasher to where people just aren't used to that for me. So uh, the, the story is amazing. And it's just, it's one of the few things that's living in my head right now. So it's like, I want, I want to make it. Uh, so if, if I... Yeah, yeah, we're just going to do our best, raise all the funds we can, and and make it. Because it's a very minimalistic story that's just... 
like scary. I think I may make my first actual scary movie. Like anybody can make, I don't want to say anybody. I'm not trying to undercut anyone, but like horror films are many different aspects of horror films. You can have cheesy horror films. You can have gory horror films. But like to make a film that actually like has you on the edge of your seat and is just like slowly pushing you further to that edge, that's a hard thing to do. That's a very hard thing to do. And that's, I mean, that's my goal. Well, you, you I guess if, if you got to step outside your comfort zone, because, you know, you, you have been the guy that does the monsters. You've been the one. Yeah. Right. And this, this has got to be vastly different. So, I mean, I, I guess you do. I don't have to build a suit. <laughs> ah. So, so there's there's bonus points there. You don't have to build a monster, right? But uh, so but you got to get but you're going to have to go probably good on the on the uh, uh, the kill scenes and stuff like that. Oh yeah, it's gonna be gory as hell. There's a scene where somebody gets like the edge of a fireplace, a brick fireplace. Somebody gets their head just bashed into that. Yeah, um, yeah there's gore in it for sure. <laughs> Are, are you like me? I've 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 got these death scenes like plotted out. I know it's bad. I'm I'm jotting them down and stuff and use them for references. But I have death scenes that I got rolling around in my head that I want to see in a movie, and then I'll work the movie. I have to make the movie around it to put the death scene. In. <laughs> Dude, what's, um, what's crazy is I haven't had to like. I can remember like years ago like the death scenes it's like okay i gotta make sure that these death scenes are the best thing in this movie and i don't know when but at some point i just stopped caring about that <laughs> like it'll 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 get there it'll be gory it'll be hopefully different well, that's cool it's you know you, like i said you you uh are the I want to say the monster movie guys um and you know it, it's it, but but to be honest you know you you you're even your monster movies are you know pretty worlds apart so it's not that you're you know making kind of the same movie it's not like you're making jaws but this time it's a uh a squid and this time it's a you know killer whale it's not the same movie it's just hey the hey <laughs> hey you leave orca out of this man i love orca <laughs> especially that movie because it's that's a scary ass movie i remember being a little kid and when that when the, when they're they're full the 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 one mother orca and the baby falls out that stuck with that still sticks with me to this yeah. day. That was That's something you can't unsee. No, that was forty mm -hmm. or some years ago for me, and it's still there. It's rent free in my brain. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, I with Orca, and if I dig around, I believe I have the novelization of Orca still. Um, that. Yeah, it was in that whole vein of the Jaws knockoffs, but that's probably the best Jaws knockoff knockoff there is. But I mean, is it a Jaws knockoff or is it a different version of Moby Dick? Well, yeah, that's that's true too. <laughs> but it, it came out at that time where where they're like, oh, these are all Jaws knockoffs. Mm -hmm. How they count Grizzly. And prophecy as Jaws knockoff because it's it's animals gone wild and they're they're going through and searching. I'm like, not every animal gone wild movie is a Jaws knockoff. Come on, don't right. So yeah, Bell. I'm sure pretty soon Jaws is gonna do cocaine. <laughs> I don't know. I just I just gave to a movie called Crackoon, so we'll just see how that one goes. <laughs> The uh, um yeah there's there's got to be all these uh 
now you're gonna have all these all these animals on on drugs because of the whole thing is it was it a few years ago when people were in florida they're telling you to stop flushing your meth down the toilet because the alligators are getting addicted yeah. <laughs> and it's causing them to be aggressive <laughs> i'm like okay i didn't know that that alligators needed to be aggressive but whatever <laughs> The last thing I want one's eye on meth. <laughs> right. Well, it's the same thing with uh um supposedly that there's so many uh so much drugs in the water from being flushed that they can't be processed out through water treatment. That that's why people have like genetic disorders now. That's why people are have you know, some people are massively fertile, other people are sterile. It's because of all the drugs that are in the water. So, but I also heard the same thing about that's why uh, girls develop faster now is because all the uh, chicken, because all the hormones in chicken makes people develop faster. I don't know if that's true, but it certainly sounds like it could be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's your next movie about uh, people eating too many chicken hormones. And <laughs> um. So I, I have to ask this, and I, I really should ask this of all the filmmaker people I bring in. How far ahead in your head are you on the movies that you make? So, like, how many movies that you're not currently working on are in your head that you're you're like, oh, I got to start working on this. I got to start doing this. I'll let Ryan take this one first. Um. I think it truthfully depends on what the person is working on. Uh, you know, sounds like I'm speaking for Sean, but and I'll give an example of me, but like just watching Sean the last five years, almost working on trying to get Don't Fuck 2 out, but still finish up the other projects. Like that's kind of how ahead he seemed. Um, or if you're like me, and you get really enchanted by an idea of yours and you won't let it go, you'll sit and work for the same thing, like I said, five years. So I'm not really working ahead. I'm just working on the same thing, which is Starlet's, Starlet's Forever. But um, I think as far as in my head, I know that I have... two other movies that I see but those are Starlet sequels so so yeah still, still got to get Starlets and then you branch off from there mm -hmm. but I'm thinking about everything that I do with this one how that will affect stories for two other films see I, I, I am OCD and and I'll, I'll like jot notes down for stuff I'm currently working on and everybody's like well, why don't you do something with it I was like I don't know if I have a full story yet so <laughs> all this bullshit <laughs> break it up into acts yeah well it, now like people talk me into doing uh since I do all this stuff on YouTube is filming it and doing it episodically so I'm like well maybe I will do an episode one yeah. I could do the one story I could really definitely do episodically. The other one, I don't, I don't know if I could, but you know, um, is there anything that you've ever like really like wanted to do? Like you were moving forward on and then it just kind of fell apart on you. Starlet. Starlet. Mm -hmm. You were last time we talked, you were really close to that. So, so mm -hmm. what, what can I ask what's happened? Money. Money? Because that seems like that has to be a lot. Because you it feels like it could be. It's definitely a film that would operate on a budget larger than what we've worked with for one single picture. But it's not some crazy huge like six figure budget. Like it's nothing like that. Um between what Sean and I can do and then what our costumer Shelley Buckheimer can do, like the film will look expensive and lush. It's just the, I think the tricky part is, is getting 
people who finance horror films to understand that this is a horror movie. It's not something else. Um, I was working with a team before recently who did not want to um, market the film as a horror movie. And I thought that would have been like mass alienation. You know, yeah, you're, that's, you're that's... completely lying about what, well, I don't want to say lying. You're just not, you're not being truthful about how the film is going to turn out. And that's actually something I see happening a lot in the indie realm too. Um, a lot of filmmakers will go up to bat to uh, pitch to social media or to crowdfunding with undercooked ideas. And then they'll fundraise on one concept and then they release a movie that's completely different. Yeah, and I don't think that's fair. No. So. Or, or it's, I wouldn't say, I, I, I wouldn't say it's lying. It's kind of misleading because I've mm -hmm. seen that a lot lately. And, and, and I, I've been watching a lot of Tubi and Plex because there's just so much just indie, mm -hmm. indie movies out there and stuff like that. And, and to be honest, to be honest, a lot of them are short. So when I'm doing stuff down here and I'm like, yeah, I got like an hour or 20 before I can get ready to bed. I'll, I'll throw on a movie and watch it. And you watch the trailer and the trailer shows it's going to be this. And then you watch the movie and it is nothing like that original trailer whatsoever. And you're like, okay, did they film that like way, way, way in advance? Or did somebody re-edit it later? Or, cause you know, that scene didn't appear in the movie. That one did, you know, or whatever. And I, I, I don't get, and I hate to say this, but if I'd rented it, it I'd be pissed. It's like, if, you know, but, you know, because you put money forward. Now it's on Plex or, or Tubi. You're like, eh, I didn't spend any money on it. And you shouldn't be that way. You should be like, yeah, that's a good movie. I enjoyed that. That was, <laughs> instead of like, eh, waste, wasted time, not money. I've never understood being able to do that, though, like in good conscience. And good consciousness, you know, like I have never gone up and tried to get a movie made without knowing the complete direction of the film. And for some people, that is their creative process and it works. But there is a an in mass group here of people making film who are completely misrepresenting the film. They tell you that they're going to give you when you're giving your money to a crowdfunder, and I think this is an important discussion to actually have while we're sitting here because I feel that Sean is one of the filmmakers out there who is actually really genuine about what he's doing. Have there been times where the course of his story has had to change because of things going on? Yes, but I think that just shows versatility in your artistry. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> and I just think that uh, there are a lot of contemporaries that we have in the scene out here who aren't doing the learning. They're not doing their homework. They're not spending the time that they need to with their story is to make sure that they're delivering the product that they tell people they're going to be delivering. Yeah, it, it's... <clears throat> You're right, because if, if I had invested money into, I don't know, um, uh, uh, you know, a a movie that, that you know, okay, it was going to be this, you know, a Haunted Barn movie or something like that. I'm just making shit up here. And, you know, you, you give me like, oh, it's got this person and this person. You're like, oh, okay, okay. The sorry synopsis is, is that, you know, this was the barn that, you know, people were hung or something in. You're like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Then you get it, and then it's like, the movie finally comes out, it comes to fruition, you finally see it, and you're like, okay, that movie that you told me this was going to be is not the movie that I saw. Um, it There was a barn, uh, <laughs> and that's about it. Um, you know, I'm a sucker for the... Um, underwater or water monster horror movies total sucker for it um i just watched one the other day called the lake 
The lake makes it look like a, I, I want to say, I love Godzilla. I love Godzilla knockoff movies. I thought it was going to be a Godzilla knockoff movie. And then it ends up being more of the host. But it's Korean. I, I get a little bit of that. But the trailer told me it was going to be this full other movie. And then I watched it and I'm like, that's not the movie that I wanted to watch at all. Right. And if you have to, re- if your trailer has to be edited to where you are manipulating people into watching it, A, that's marketing. I guess it's doing its job. Yeah. But B, it's a lie. And what that does is, is it puts a bad people uh, or taste in bad people's mouths, I think. And that's reflective yeah. of the filmmaker. Like, whenever a movie is doing poorly and it's not succeeding and it has scandal, it's always the directors that they go after. Mm-hmm. But if a movie is successful and is doing great, it's always the actors everybody talks about and praises. Oh, so. Yeah. If your movie is poorly represented and people feel like they're not getting your vision because of how it was sold to them, they're going to remember that as a bad movie, I think. And they're going to be less likely to support you to watch your projects, to pay attention to the art that you're creating. Because that one, oh, yeah, that's that guy that made that one. You know, you know which one I'm talking about? Oh, mm-hmm. It's like that. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I come from the... Uh, um... The times where I was, like I said, I've, I've told this people, I've been a manager at Out of Hollywood Video f- for years. Mm-hmm. And uh, I dealt with the the movies that people would bring in, that we'd get movies that you'd never heard of, low budget indie movies, stuff like that. Because, you know, you know, they pick them up dirt cheap. And, you know, I've seen movies that were great. They were well put together the special effects may not have been great because of the budget or even the actors and then you know something will come along so maybe like oh you know that guy's now in this movie oh yeah that's why that one movie was good no that movie was good because the people came together to make that movie mm-hmm. and one actor happened to go on to bigger things you know I'm looking at henry cavill in uh hellraiser uh <laughs> <laughs> was it hell world well, but everybody a lot of the people that we look at now who are major stars got their starts in straight to video horror i mean mm-hmm. charlize theron and uh ava mendez both starred in children of the corn sequels early in their careers mm-hmm. you just said henry cavill with hellraiser Viggo mortensen was in texas chainsaw Chains- 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 so it's well, like well when you know mcconaughey and zellweger in the fourth one It's not uncommon to see that. So the reason why those movies last, though, and the reason why we still talk about those movies is because everybody understood the assignment. And they all got together, and they made a really fun, like, on-brand piece of horror. So that's how we remember it. And I think that's what's happening a lot with indie movies. But we're still stuck in, I think, this phase right now where... Every jagoff with an iPhone can be a filmmaker. And they can make a movie. And that's great. Go out and do the damned thing. That's what Sean and I did. But don't hit the ground running so hard. You're going to face plant. Take time. Actually deliver the products you say you're going to be delivering. Because it's creating this vacuum in the indie scene where it's so hard to fundraise movies. Because everybody's fundraising. It's Everyone crazy is. crazy right now. And the ones that are succeeding are the ones who I find are delivering these undercooked concepts. So. I saw like, I'm not, I'm just to chime in, but it's like. That's not, sorry, I just want to say because we have a lot of friends fundraising right now. So I'm not talking about people specifically. Right. That might be considered shot fired or shade, whatever. But all I'm saying is, is a lot of people are getting the ability to make movies right now and they're getting a lot of money thrown at them. And so while they're getting a lot of money thrown at them, it leaves a lot less at the table for people who are more willing to develop, develop and deliver a quality product. 
and, and to be honest, that's one of the things that's, that's scary to me is because people are like, well, you've got your idea. You've got your, your, what you want to do with the movie or, or with your ideas. I'm like, yeah. They're like, well, have you crowdfunded it yet? I'm like, no, because I, I don't have it really nailed down to what I want to do. Well, you, get, get your money first and then you can go from there. I'm like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to. <laughs> I definitely, I, as I've said this before, I was like, I, yeah, I'm taking forever to make my first movie. But I want to make my first movie. And if it fucks up, it's going to be 100% me, my fault. I fucked it up because I snapped. Whatever. I don't want to fuck it up because of, you know, I, I, I was supposed to start shooting when COVID hit. And then COVID hit. And then I postponed everything. And then, of all things, I was watching TV late one night. And I found a movie that was really close to the idea I came up with. So I shit canned my entire idea. And, you know, I could have been moving forward, had a budget and everything else like that. And then I've been like, change the movie. Like, like Ryan said, it would have been a completely different movie than what I told people it was going to be to begin with, because I saw a movie that was too similar to it. I don't want to do that. So, you know, have you well, ever ran what? into that? It's your first movie, Paul. Here's the tip. You're going to fuck up. See, I want it to be all my fault. <laughs> and it will be. It was 100% my fault. That's what's going to be said at the end after credits. This is all <laughs> due to fall right there. <sighs> there are, though, speak, speaking of, like, I don't know if it's an undercooked idea. I don't know. I don't know what goes through some people's heads, but it's like, okay, for, like, for, for the campaign we're running right now, we didn't we didn't choose to do a video. We looked at our video stats from our most successful campaign to our least successful campaign, and still the max views on that video was like 175 views. Now, with that being said, there are some people, though, like I, I watched three different crowdfunding campaigns within the last month, and I'm watching them, and I'm like, this is all stock video. Like, they just downloaded random video from stock sites and, like, put their story together. Like, Ew, I don't really? Know cheating, but it felt like cheating. Like, no, I, I watched a movie the other day. It could have been called Stock Footage, the movie. And you would have been like, yeah. They, they, I think probably out of like an, I think 70 minute runtime, I want to say maybe 20 minutes of it were not stock footage. It, it was ridiculous. I mean, yeah, it was lots of scenes like the ocean. And then it would like, you know, sunrise and stuff like that. I'm like, they just buy all this or do they go out and film any of this because I'm pretty sure I've seen this in another commercial. <laughs> right. Like we may have to use stock footage every now and then for like transitions and second unit stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean the moon rise or were... Yeah. Well, you guys live in we we live in Ohio. You know, if you have if you're filming a movie that takes place in uh, you know, fucking California and you want to use the beach or something you're going to use stock footage that of the beach and stuff to put in no, there we're, not. we're going out to Houston Woods we're going out to Houston Woods <laughs> <laughs> uh, see the worst part about it I made the mistake of telling people that um, I now own a cabin in the woods uh, <laughs> on a lake in Michigan and now everybody's Which like lake? um it's in Brighton, Michigan, and I think it's Friendship Lake, I think is what it's called. Um, it's funny because if you go down to the lake and you walk like 100 yards and there's a fence, but the fence kind of ends about 20 feet before you get to the lake, you go past that, that's a state park. It's 100% illegal to fish there. It's 100% illegal to, to, to cook, you know, do all that. Mm -hmm. But you walk on my side... I can throw my boat in the water. I can fish. I don't need a license. I can build a bonfire. I don't have any problem with that. 
and it's all within just like this little narrow spot. But it's it's everybody goes, oh, it's a cabin in the woods. Like, yeah, it's not really. It's on the lake, and um, there's a woods kind of around there. But uh, literally, there's a house on one side, a house on the other side, and a house across the street. <laughs> it's a residential cabin in the woods. <laughs> but I guess if you filmed it right, you could definitely make it look like it. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, the uh, um, but no, you like that, like uh, you know, I, I've told people, I was like, well, I, I guess if I go up there, you could be right along with us, you could film all the footage you want and then go back home and use whatever you need. But see, Paul, if you have that, then take something and write a story for that location, yeah. Well, I, I wrote. I, I I wrote a story and it takes place. I can I can do all the the stuff, you know, local. I can run it out of my shop. I can run it out of my house and stuff. It's one I've been working on forever, but now I've kind of got an end, and now I don't know what to do because literally, it was the 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 name of the story was Life, Love, and the Pursuit of Giant Size X Men One, and it was about me and my wife and all the shit that I did, being an alcoholic and and all the bullshit that I went through. And, uh, um, you know, finally getting my shit together and stuff like that. Well, the whole thing was, was I was always still looking for that giant size X-Men number one. Well, now I own one. Now I'm like, shit, my story's over. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I got to make up some bullshit now. So now I got to change it to the only last thing I need to get my, my, my holy trilogy of five things I've always wanted. I'm down to one thing. And that is a 77 Firebird Trans Am black and gold. <laughs> I will own one one day. <laughs> I have a giant size X Men. I got that. I have a full set of Stormtrooper armor. <laughs> you know, I've actually seen the screen used car that you just described. I've seen. I've seen. Um, it. it was in the Hollywood Museum. I was out there with uh, Shelley last summer. And up on the second floor, I think it's the second, second or third floor, all these exhibits of famous cars from shows with their costumes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only did they have Smokey's car or the Bandit's car up there, they also had um, Adam West's Batmobile with some of the costumes and things. And then, you know, this is off topic, but I was really geeking because right behind it was a display of all of the Catwoman costumes used in the movies up through Halle Berry. No, up through Anne Hathaway. They hadn't added Zoe Kravitz to it yet. So that was cool. I, I am a total sucker for the uh, Michelle Pfeiffer Catwoman. That's, uh, I don't care. To see a replica of it in person is insane because, you know, when you see it on film, it looks stitched. But to see it in person, you're like, wow, that's paint. Like, they didn't stitch her. That was all hand-painted X's with white to make it look like she'd been stitched. Nice. Yeah. That's cool, though. It's, uh, well... It that's like I, I'm. I'm not gonna lie. I've I've ran into uh, um, uh, doing conventions and stuff. I've actually seen real movie props from like big budget movies, and I'm like, mm -hmm. dude, that's a painted Nerf gun. What the hell? <laughs> Isn't it funny how small and inconsequential it looks in person? Yeah, yeah. You're just like um, uh, one of my favorite TV shows growing up was the original Battlestar Galactica, and I was at the booth, and this guy had one of the prop guns from Battlestar Galactica. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a hero gun, so it was one of the ones that was screen used and everything else. And I'm just looking at it, and I'm like, dude, this just looks like a toy that somebody spray-painted black. It looks so cheap right up close to you, and you're just like, oh, huh. that's disappointing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I ever... Right if you are ever in Washington, D.C. and you're at the Smithsonian uh, and you, they have a pair of the ruby slippers there and sad. That's all I'll say is it's sad. I, I, 
we watched that documentary on the uh, uh, missing Ruby slippers. Mm -hmm. And my wife loves, Tina loves uh, Lizard of Oz. And I mean, you watch him in the movie and then you see him like even close up on just regular TV and you're just like, that can't be the same shoe. It's <laughs> Right. Yeah. So. But that's color grading and lighting. and Oh, yeah. Because, you know, you, you can use technical, you got technicolor and make everything bright and shiny and, and mm -hmm. pretty and beautiful. That's the only reason why those shoes wore red. Yeah. In the book they're silver. Yeah, I was gonna say they're not even red in the mm -hmm. books. Yeah, mm -mm. they just made them ruby red so that way they pop like that. Yep. And Technicolor. I love Technicolor. Yep. There, 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 I there's do a lot of research on color and Technicolor and why things were picked to look the certain way they did for old Hollywood movies because. Some people will note and comment like, oh gosh, like, would people really wear that in real life? And it's like, no, they couldn't. It was just picked because it would look neat. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot of these costumes are so impractical. They're, they're, mm -hmm. I, I go back, we were talking about Batman, the original um, uh, Michael Keaton Batman. Dude, he couldn't turn his head. It just looked good on film. You, didn't... <laughs> mm -hmm. you can't do this. You got to move your whole body when you when you look the other direction. This is impractical. Did he get that? more mobility in the second one? Yeah, he did, but it still was not great. It took until they got to um, Christian Bale before they able got the, the the head really where he could move you know all directions without it looking weird on film. And that's the dumb shit. Right You're right. They have to turn with their shoulders. Yeah. I ain't gonna go look this way. I ain't gonna look this way. I only had to do that when I dropped a couch on my head. And yes, I dropped a couch. On my head. Wow. Uh, actually, I did not drop the couch on my head. We were moving it. My buddy dropped the couch, and we you, you ever go to the old like an upstairs, and you have that little area that's you know like a closet above it. I was pushing, and I got up like this. He drops it. I go back like this, so the whole house hits me in the head between the wall. And my... oh, I had to God. take like I had to take like three days off work because I couldn't turn my neck. I was like, "How are you doing? I'm doing good, fine." <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's yeah, some really bad I... whiplash, Paul. And the worst part about it is, is that that. Uh, I don't, I don't, you know, it didn't hurt very long, about three A's, and now it's back to normal. It's just stiff. Now as I'm getting older, now I sound like a freaking box of uh, Rice Krispies every time I move. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> My buddy yells at me when we're at the gym. I work out, and all of a sudden he's like, was that you? I'm like, yeah, that was me. That was, that was my back. <laughs> he's like, you're making all kinds of noises. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> it happens. Even, though I'm, even though I'm the youngest of the two of us but <laughs> yeah. but he has to he has to wuss out because he's he's got like he's he can't do any leg exercises his, he has no cartilage in his knees so I'm mm. over there leg pressing he's just sitting there I'm like I just, just make sure that chair doesn't get away <laughs> uh, so <laughs> Get back to get back to talking about movies. We're talking about random shit here. Um, so I I gotta ask with the rise of now these free streaming networks like uh, uh, Tubi and Plex and stuff like that. Uh, has has that changed the game for you guys? I want to say yes. I can definitely say. Like to be hands down, like as, as far as the films that we have in distro and the films that we self distribute, um, which are both on to be, um, yeah, we make we make the most money off of to be, which I don't I don't feel like 
we could have saw this coming like a day and age to where people can watch movies for free and the filmmakers are still still making money yeah that's that's shocking because i mean what five years ago everybody was worried because everybody's you know people were still pirating like right. brand new movies that that and and i think it's and and to be honest is it's, as, as somebody who has pirated a movie in the past and stuff like that i never pirated like a low budget indie film because yeah. i always felt horrible because that's that's there's you know, if I if I did a Marvel movie, it's it's one thing that's you know whatever. I'm still going to buy it eventually, anyways. But with you know low budget, that you know one sale or one rental could mean more money for your next movie. Right. And I've always been one of the ones who I was, you know, like I said, I'll go back to when I worked at the video store. I was that advocate for indie horror. And indie movies, period, when I worked there, because I was a guy that, and worst part, I knew who would watch it and who wouldn't. Because you'd always have the people, oh, that's cheesy as shit. There's no money in that. I'm like, yeah. But you had them other guys like, you need to watch this movie, this movie, and this movie. And they're like, oh, yeah, dude, that was awesome. Man, you know, they didn't have no budget. Man, they, when they tore that top of that guy's head off, it looked so good. I'm like, exactly. <laughs> Well, and I, I I'll, I'll say this, and I will say this till the day I die, is indie movies have the most heart, and indie horror has more heart than most, because one is is that there is money, but it's very little, um, or or next to none, um, so it's a it's a passion project. Each one is a passion project. It's not that that you're you know you're like oh, I'm I'm a gun for hire, I got paid twenty thousand dollars to shoot this movie, and it, you have nothing in it. You have nothing, you know. You don't have a horse in the race. You don't. You're just like oh, I got, I got went to work today. I filmed this movie and I went home. But now right. if it's your movie, you have the horse in the race. You're the one directing it. You're gonna put your ass into that because you want it to be better than what you know. You want, you know, what, it, what somebody told me this. It goes, you wanted to make a $20,000 movie look like it had a $100,000 budget, you know, and there are movies that have a $3 million budget that look like they have a $20,000 budget because, right, you know, or they spent all their money on one actor. And you had them for three days. I get it. I get it. You, that's not a thing. I understand that that helps sell movies. I get it. I, whatever. But I am also one of the people who believes that you shouldn't take away from your your film or your your art just to get, you know, I, I won't even say any names, but to get be you know, you know big time actor to be on set for three days and have him film his ten minutes in the movie or her 10 minutes and go from there. You know, yes, you know, I have legitimately written stuff with certain people in mind, but guess what? If I can't get them, I will definitely get somebody better and get them for, you know, one tenth of the budget <laughs> of that now, one person. I feel like that's something, I don't know that, that, I can't say all indie filmmakers by any means, but like we're getting to a, like a time where it's between crowdfunding and I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a method here. If you have several big names or even several small names in a film, it's going to help get a bigger upfront payout from distro. So you'll see, like, I don't know. There's there's some films that'll crowdfund and have like ten like B horror actors in it that'll all be in it for like three to five minutes. Yep. It's like it, it just like Wishmaster. <laughs> it sucks because it like I feel like it. I feel like those things 
then change people's mind about independent film. It's like when they get that movie and they're like, this is, I would imagine, going to be awesome. It's got all these people in it. And then it's like all those people were in it for like two scenes because that's all they could afford those people for. And it's like, it's just damning a little bit. Well, also, you get away from that whole fact is that if you bring a big name actor into a movie and they disappear or they're only in it like, oh, you know, hey, he's, you know, you got in blah, blah, blah. He's the bartender in one scene. OK, but if you have a pretty much a unknown cast, one of the best things about that is, is uh, you don't know a who's going to die, what order they're going to die. It's not like you have the one. OK, it's not like you have five girls and then you have, you know, you actually were able to get, OK, Daniel Harris or somebody like that for the entire shoot. You know Daniel Harris is going to last till the end because you paid her a shit ton of money to be here. <laughs> right. So, you know those other four girls are gone. <laughs> but when you have five girls that most people don't know, people are like, they'll get vet invested in each of them. And then when they die, you're like, ah, damn it. I like that one. <laughs> I, I can't remember. I, I, can't remember. I was watching a movie the other day. And um, it was all, it was an indie film. It was all low budget. This one dude in it, he was funny. I liked the character, everything. And I, I was like, I got invested in him. And I was like, yeah. And then he dies. I'm like, oh man, son of a bitch. <laughs> the one I really liked. But now that insipid bitch over there, she's going to last till the end. She did. <laughs> so... And you can almost, I hate to say this, but there's certain movies that you can see that you know that the girl, the main girl, that's the director's girlfriend, or it's his wife, or it's his, <laughs> or the girl he's trying to hook up with. <laughs> there's some out there like that, for sure. And I'm not saying that because I I'm, I don't mean shade towards anybody, because I, I know you worked with your ex-wife and stuff like that. That's, you know, whatever. Because you also, the only other thing about that is, is that you also know that that person's going to work for you if, if well, hell, you that was because she was one hell of a liar and i believed every moment <laughs> so that's why i went that route <laughs> oh man we, we what was it uh we were watching something they're like oh yeah be careful the woman's a monster and i'm like isn't that every woman everybody just looks at me and went, what did you just say <laughs> I was like, I don't know. That's just me. That's what I had to say today. <laughs> uh, as I, I say, I say that stuff around my wife and my wife just looks at me and I'm like, you know, I'm not really. <laughs> She's like, I know. Shut up. <laughs> oh, that was... <laughs> that's, that's also what happens when you've been, been together for 30 years too. So I can, I can give her all kinds of shit and she gives me shit. But we're also the first two people that will finish each other's sentences or go, that guy looks like, and we'll land into think, oh, yeah, you were thinking the same thing. Yeah, I was definitely thinking. <laughs> I, I, um, damn, uh, I don't know. Are you guys, either one of you watching Yellow Jackets? I watched the first season, but I, I don't want to pay for Showtime again. Oh. It's 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 part of my uh, 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 spectrum app, so I just watch it on there. But uh, me and her got really into that, and we're just like, I was like, man, it's like when did Rose from freaking uh, uh, Two and a Half Men? She got really good at acting. <laughs> I was like, or has she just always been crazy? Maybe the the whole Rose thing is not. Oh, it... nope. well. Uh, it... Ryan, you're 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 silent again. Nope. There we go. I said Melanie Linsky is always been very talented actor. Always. Well, that's like uh, Tina did not know that she was in uh, was it Beautiful Creatures. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And, and she did not know she was uh, from New Zealand. And we were watching the behind the interview thing. And all of a sudden her voice comes out and Tina just looks and goes, is it? I was like, yeah, she, you know, she's from New Zealand. Right. And she's like, no. And I was like, she worked with, with uh, uh, P, uh, Peter Jackson and stuff. And she's like, I was like, her legit first kiss was Kate Winslet from Titanic. What? <laughs> but also she was in like Ever After and Sweet Home Alabama. And oh, yeah, she was in Sweet Home Alabama. Although um, I never finished Coyote Home. Ugly. So I, I, I'm sorry. It was bad. I feel like I, I, I feel like Coyote Ugly would be the one though, that you should remember her from, Paul. I feel like that's your movie. It's one of your favorites. It was so bad when uh, Tina talked me into watching Sweet Home Alabama, and I'm sitting there watching it with her, and I'm legitimately, I, I'm so out of, I don't really care, and it's bad because I, I'm not, I do not like uh, what Renee, not Renee Zellweger, um, Reese Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon. And I'm like, is it bad that I want the two guys that are fascinated with her to end up together and just leave her behind? Because <laughs> that character is not likable at all. <laughs> she really wasn't, though. No. And, and then I think we end up watching something else. But it was one of the ones we started watching it. And she goes, can I turn this off? I was like, yes, you can most certainly turn that movie off. <laughs> uh. So, so I have to ask, this has nothing to do with movie. Have you ever sat down, either one of you, started watching a movie and just got in there like, yeah, no, this is bullshit. I am done and walked yeah, away. Yeah, two days ago. I was about to be like, didn't we just do that yesterday or something? What yeah, was what it? were we watching? I don't even remember. <laughs> it's that bad. And it was something new that everybody's been watching, and we turned it on, and I was like, Sean, I have no idea what's going on. Oh, okay. You didn't so, either. I can't remember what it was, but... Was it on Peacock? I really don't remember. Was it was, it, was it, was it, was it, was it, Paul. was it knock at the cabin, uh, the knock at the cabin door? No, I don't finish that. Okay. No. I just watched that the other day. I watched Cocaine Bear last night. Um, and was it something in the, in the grass or in the, I'm trying to think of the movies that were just on there. Cause they put Megan on there. Um, there's another horror movie, like something. About no, it was. I can't remember. Well, we didn't buy it, so it wouldn't have been on Voodoo. No. I'm trying to go through the apps we like mainly use. Was it on Paramount Plus? No, because that one, we kind of only use it for TV shows. I, I only use Paramount Plus for Star Trek. Um, it had to... I think it was on Netflix. Either way, no, whatever okay. it was. Oh, okay. Well, definitely, you've you've walked away from a movie recently, yeah. and uh, so so I I, I also got to ask because me and my son, we when we went and seen Renfield the other day, they had a new A twenty four movie at the beginning of the uh, at the 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 trailers. Um. How do you guys feel about people now? Like, oh, that's smart horror. Or or art horror. What do you guys think about that? I, I, um, I, one of the people that... I think that, it's always been around. Well, I just yeah. think that people are looking at it cross-eyed now because there's other ways to describe the genre. Elevated horror. Um, you just... It's always been there. It's always been around. Especially in Europe. So... It's nothing new. It's just what's trendy right now. Um, I'm not knocking it necessarily. I've seen some of them that I think are really good. Um, like, for instance, I watched Midsummer, and I only have to watch that movie one time in my life. I never have to see that again because it's, it's burned in your brain. I've not watched Midsummer for the simple fact is that I didn't like Hereditary. 
and people give me shit about that, but I did not like that movie. I, I Miss it, Summer just it catches you by surprise. <laughs> And, and at this point, though, it's it's I already know how everything ends because everybody's ruined it. So it's like, and do I really need to watch it? I just yeah, I even knew going in, and I still watched it, and I was still disturbed. But I'm never going to watch it again. Right. I felt Midsummer was better than Hereditary. Hereditary took a turn that literally into a pole. Well. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, my whole thing is, is that how is that kid not in jail? <laughs> Amongst the many other questions that we found ourselves asking when watching Hereditary. Have you seen the meme with uh, uh, Cher from Clueless going and like looking behind her and it says Hereditary? <laughs> my bad. Uh, that makes me laugh every time. Um, but no, it's, it's, well, yeah, to answer your question, Paul, I do not have a problem with the more moodier, artsier side of horror at all. Um, I think people need to stop acting like so hateful about it because it's been around for a long time. Well, that's like people talk about, oh, slow burn movies. Those are new. I'm like, really, man, I've been watching slow burn movies, slow burn horror movies since I was a kid. And and I'm rapidly approaching 50, so that was a long time ago. So, but there uh, are so many classic movies that people love that in their time were considered slow burns, like not as though the movie Halloween was like a breakneck speed thriller, like that is a slow burn. Oh, yeah, not much yeah. happens until the sun goes down. Well. Somebody pointed it out to me one time is he goes, uh, Halloween's a Western. Yeah, it, I could see that. Bad guys, and bad guys they, but also bad that guys. makes sense because John Carpenter loves his Westerns. Yep. And I looked it up. I found the, the, I don't think I own it anymore, but I had a book and it was taught the making of Halloween. And it talks about how he wrote it as a Western. It's the bad guys coming to bad guys here. Bad guy takes out people. Then you have the showdown at the end. In the movie, bad good guy wins, mm -hmm. bad guy loses. So, <laughs> but, uh, it, it's I, I don't know. Part of me thinks that 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 there's too much out there, but then the other part of my brain goes, maybe there's not enough out there. Does that make sense? I don't. I don't. It. it I think with, like you said, with easy access, you know, I can legitimately go outside right now, take my phone and record and make a movie. I have the editing software on my computer. I can shoot a movie, have it done in a day and have it finished, you know, in a week. And yeah, you got that. But then you get a lot more people making movies. Yeah, you're going to get a lot more bad, but the chance of now getting good movies has now gone up because just the sheer amount you know of people out there doing it there's going to be better movies so mm -hmm. um, i'm uh i'm an old school guy grew up on the video store and if i've told people this i was like if you'd have told 14 year old paul that he was just gonna be able to go in and turn on a tv and watch whatever i wanted to watch whenever i wanted to watch it uh I would be a 400 pound albino that still lived in my parents' house. So <laughs> I would have never stepped outside. I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch another movie. Right. <laughs> my mom would have never kicked me out. <laughs> my stepdad would have tried, but my mom wouldn't have. <laughs> but I'm still, I'm still in my head. I'm focused on what that movie was that we shut off. <laughs> I've narrowed it down to Peacock. We were on was Peacock. Well, it was on Peacock. See, that that's another thing I, I do like now that everything's streaming. So I don't feel like I'm I'm ripping myself off if it, like halfway through a movie, I'm like, yeah, this movie sucks. And I just shut it off and go to another movie. If I rented a movie or if I actually went and got a videotape or a DVD, I felt like, well, I put effort into it. Want to go finish watching this movie. And that right, it's not 
paid for strangers pray at night and then felt ripped off at the end. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, God, was it how how the Howling Four? I think was the one that irritated the shit out of me as a, as an adult because it's the one where the werewolf never shows up to last like three seconds of the movie. Was that the marsupial one? No, the marsupial one's just batshit insane. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Australian made howling movie with uh, marsupial werewolves. And no, it's, uh, I want to say it's like Howling, the original nightmare or something like that, or the original. Damn it. Um, oh, while, while, while I'm talking about this, how do you feel about everybody now using making Amityville movies or making the American insert name here? So there's, I've been going through, there was what, like American, and then there was like American Haunted House, uh, American Werewolf, American Vampire, American Ripper, or stuff like that. And you're like, I get the fact that that comes, it's an A, so it'll show up at the top of lists. But why would you put American? <laughs> I mean, but alpha stacking, I mean, I don't know. For me, it's like, 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 well, the Amityville movies. It's like, oh my god, how many Amityville movies are there? There's, I mean, there's an Amityville Sasquatch. I see one called there's Amityville a, Moon. There's an Amityville, Amityville Werewolf. Amityville Backpack. Uh, the Amityville Shark. There's Amityville Vibrator. That makes sense, at least. Because <laughs> it's... <laughs> but... And then you get, now you get the, um, um, see, the one I thought that you couldn't use was, because uh, um, now there's just a shit ton of Ouija movies. And I thought that was owned by Hasbro because the two Ouija movies that appear in the theaters have, you know, Hasbro's name attached because they own right. the rights to produce the, and by the way, it is Howling for the original Nightmare. There it is. Maybe. That's got to be a Moses small town suffering mental breakdown, tormented by demons and werewolves. Maybe that's it. I think that's the one where the werewolf legitimately shows up in the last three seconds of the movie. It literally like, jumps out of a wall. You see the werewolf movie ends. So, the rest of it's taken from werewolf vision, so it like does that weird color change. Like POV. Weird, yeah, the weird color change POV when, he's the, when it's the werewolf. Yeah, so... But I, I just, and I get that some of the, the movies are just fun, you know, but there's there's all these. And like I said, there's ones that I didn't know you could get away with by using the weird Ouija without it being, you know, like Hasbro going, uh, 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 no. So I think that's because Hasbro did not invent the talking board. Well, they didn't make, they didn't invent G.I. Joe either, but. But G.I. Joe is a specific character. That's it. Uh, well, G.I. Joe is the name of the team. And so I went to the, when I was in Salem, I went to the Spirit Board Museum. <laughs> and yes, so Parker Brothers created the Ouija game. Yeah. Which Hasbro eventually bought. Mm hmm. But they did not invent talking boards. They did not invent Ouija. So you can, I think, get away with it as long as it does not look like one of Hasbro's products. That's See, the catch. Nah. See, I could legitimately take care of that myself because I, ironically enough, I don't believe Ouija boards work. My wife does. And uh, I buy them all the time. I've probably got like 10 or 12 of them and none of them are, I, the, the only new ones I've bought are the ones I've bought for Tina. Like I just bought her the silver shamrock glow in a dark one at Horror Hound. So she has that one. But now I have one that's I right about a hundred years old and it's Egyptian themed. And instead of going like the board this way, the board goes this way. So you got, it's, it's long ways instead of width ways. And it's uh, I'll tell you what. 
if you're looking to get rid of that thing, you ought to talk to the folks in Salem because like legitimately they go out of their way to like acquire interesting, unique pieces for the Steerboard Museum. I bought a 1970 edition of Ouija that was made in Salem while I was there. <laughs> well, the the one, I mean, the, it's it's way back there. If you can see the Power Ranger helmets here, above that is a mm -hmm. Ouija board, and that's from, I think, the 40s. So that's one of the early Parker Brothers versions. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, Do you know best... why Ouija was so popular? Well, that was during that whole time when spiritualism was really, really big in America. Well, yeah, but... The, the school of thought is Ouija only works if there's a man and a woman operating the board together alone in a room. To get people to hook up? To get, it was the only way they could like get together and like put their knees together and touch their hands and like be intimate without a chaperone. Wow. I didn't even think mm -hmm. about that. That's crazy. And I learned that at the museum because there's a whole like little display about it. And there's a picture, I believe Norman Rockwell painted it of a couple sitting at a cute little like uh, wire cafe table and their knees are together and they're touching and the girl looks all coquettish. And it was just talking uh, like about the history about how people played Ouija because it was an excuse to physically touch someone. That's insane. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. But I, I will tell you this, I have a great story connected to the almost 100-year-old board I have, because I got it through the mm -hmm. shop. Uh, it was found in an abandoned house north of Sydney, it gets better, with a doll in a closet. How oh, cool. It, and um, the guy brings them in. He goes, you buy weird stuff, right? At the time, I had, uh, I think I still had a, 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 a children's coffin at the shop. And I had some, like, uh, um, uh, um, weird taxidermy things still floating around. <clears throat> and he's like, yeah, he goes, I got this, I got a Ouija board and I got this doll. And I was like, well, let me see the Ouija board. And he brings it in. And uh, it had gotten a little water damaged at the bottom, and it smelt bad. But I'm like, man, I, I think I can salvage this. I think I can, I can do something with it. I can clean it up and get rid of the smell. And and uh, he's like, all right. He goes, well, it can't. It, he goes, it, there, it was in a closet with a doll. And I'm like, all right. Well, let's see the doll. And he brings this doll in. It's still in the box. It's it's got one of the ones where it's got the like the 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 um you know you take the box lid and you kind of flip it around it and you. <laughs> It's got all the, mm. all the old, almost look like Victorian clothes on and stuff like that. And it still looked really nice, but it had gotten so mildewy and moldy that it stunk so bad that I didn't want it. And I'm like, man, part of me wishes I would have kept it just to have the story. And I'd put it in a case and put it up front and people ask about it. I was like, where'd that come out? It came out of a haunted house. That'd been my story from then on. <laughs> Did I have a plan chat with it or was it just the board? It was just the board. I don't have a plan chat. I only have, I probably got 12 boards and I think I have maybe four or five plan chats because those always got lost. And mm -hmm. um, then I found out some of them just did not come with one because you used a, mm -hmm. um, a drinking glass. You used a, mm -hmm. like a rocks glass. And so it never had a plan chat to begin with. So, and, and then of course I've ordered. Yep the Buffy the Vampire Slayer one, and I've ordered the Elvira one through Diamond at least five times each, and I've never got the first one. <laughs> it's a good thing I don't pay for that shit in advance, because I'd be pissed. But I probably should just go ahead and order them off of Amazon at this point, just to make sure I get them. <laughs> right. But, yeah, it, it's... I, I get I get really kind of weird stuff through the shop from time to time like i've gotten a couple ouija boards through the shop and there's literally one still set in there and it's on top of an arcade cabinet and people are like is that real i'm like yeah and you stay with it in the shop i'm like yeah you're not worried about it i'm like no no i'm not worried about it i'm not worried about the toy from parker brothers bringing a demon into my house <laughs> thank you yeah so if, if it was anything, that would be, um, I have 
Ah, uh, no, it's not even on this bookshelf. Uh, I have a hundred, almost hundred year old book on demonology and, and witchcraft. I have all this stuff like that. And they're like, you worried about that? Not worried about that. Hey, Sean, you should show Paul what I got you from Salem. No, no. I think he'll appreciate it. Uh, nope, it is on a different bookshelf. Is it behind Dracula? Is it behind Dracula? Let's see. So, to start this out. Ouija boards, Ouija boards, whatever. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> I'm good. There's certain things that I'm just weird about. And I feel like some people would be weird about this item that I'm about to show. But I'm not. Oh, the, the Baphomet uh, statue. Yeah. I... I have one. No, no, sorry. I don't have it anymore. I gave it to my buddy uh Brent. So I do not have one anymore. I do have a I do have a Ram's head on the wall though. I do have a legit Ram's head on the wall. <laughs> I saw that in a shop and like I had jokingly told Sean like I was gonna bring him a Baphomet statue from Salem. He's like, nah. I mean I, well actually I'd take one of them. That'd be cool. And I saw that one. I was like, "All right." And it was like that statue was forty-five bucks, or I could get him a cute little baby goat plushie for forty. <laughs> get the cool statue. I was like, "I'm gonna get that cool little statue." And so some people have seen it in the house and have asked questions. <laughs> oh my mom! My mom is like convinced. <laughs> I don't want to say that she is the most Christian Christian I know. Um, and I know she won't watch this, but she believes she is in her head to where she saw this and she was like, it took her a couple of days, but then she was like, so is that what you believe in? <laughs> I'm like, no, it looks cool. Like, she, I don't have like, I do have a pentagram flag, but not like hung up. It was a bonus thing for something I bought. Uh, but you know, I'm not running around here and being like, say time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, hey, hey, I was, uh, I don't know if I was out of high school yet when my dad finally asked me. We're sitting at a restaurant one day and uh, no, I, was, I, was, I had to be out of high school because I, I was wearing a white zombie t-shirt. And um he looks at me and he's like, can I ask you a question? I'm like, sure. Wondering where this is going to go. And he's like, are you a devil worshiper? And I'm like, yeah, dad. Yeah, I worship the devil in my free time. I'm like, no, I don't believe in the devil. I don't believe. <laughs> I was like, I've, I've actually, I've been called the devil. There's, there's a woman that I worked with legit to this day still swears to people that I am the devil and that I was brought here to test her. And I went, hey, that's awful arrogant of you to think that I, the devil, got a job in Piqua in a shitty factory <laughs> just to screw with you. <laughs> I feel that some, I feel that about my uh, youngest son sometimes, but that's also because there for a while he would introduce himself as the devil, which was fun, like meeting new people. Hi, I'm the devil. Like it was it was weird, but well, you know, it's like I, I get people because we got Vincent and everybody's like, Why do you name Vincent Vincent? And I I, I make up a different story every time. And of course we say Vincent Price. We say Vinnie Paul from Pantera. I've even said Alice Cooper because Alice Cooper's real name is Vincent. Uh, I just go through all this thing and they're like, really? No. Just a name. <laughs> just a... Right. Like, 
And uh, it, the, the the it's like people ask me now because uh, I don't know if my cats are floating around here anywhere. I got Mazikeen, which is my cat, and Lucy Purr, which is my wife's cat. So <laughs> we have Lucy Purr, the cat, and we have Mazikeen, the cat. But then we got our dogs, Courage, Abby, and Lulu. <laughs> and I'm a badass, so I got to roll around with my corgis. When you see me, that's not the dog you assume I'm going to own, is my corgis. <laughs> and, and I had, a, I had a guy years ago, he goes, yeah, I saw this guy walking a dog at like one o'clock in the morning. And uh, this is when I still had like long, long black, you know, hair and and uh, black leather coat. And I'm out there. He goes, yeah, what guy was watching it, walking his dog at like one o'clock in the morning. And I looked down at the corgi and I realized it was you. And I'm like, yeah, my dog's got to go outside, dude. Right. Uh, um, shit, we can't, we can get way off topic here. Um, so what other projects do you guys got working on? You got anything else coming after the, the, the current Indiegogo stuff? I mean, I feel we have projects, um, but nothing like immediate. Yeah. But we just released She Burns Chapter 3 on YouTube. Yeah. Well, I had talked to you because we were going to do the uh, – um, the horror host you're uh she burns in hell and then you you mm -hmm. gave me the okay and then you told then then i found out three was coming out so i was like okay well i'll postpone that till three comes out and then i'll put that with that together because i'm doing uh um uh, a friday the 13th fan film and then we were going to do yours so and that's why cool I, and uh and hopefully when because that's me and tina our show together which i've actually conned tina into working with me on my shows but I have to work with her on her schedule. So it's not one I put out monthly. It's one I put out whenever I can get Tina to set, help set up the set because I have to cover up all this bullshit I have setting over here and then bring in the, uh, the, we have the candles and the Ram's head and, and, uh, and uh, it's funny because uh, uh, the last one is, is that my wife, for, for those who know, is my wife is, is a witch. She's a pagan witch, legit whatever and um so the other show is called the doctor and the witch and um i'm sitting there because me and her she's arguing with me and she's giving me shit so i just hold up a book and i'm start reading it and it's the malice maleficarum and i was like how to deal with it it's a tough witch wife and she just looks over she's that's not even right and i go i know and i just keep going and i was like <laughs> none of that none of that was planned that was just a book i happened to have on for the set and i picked it up and people were like was it was it planned? I was like, no, not planned any in remotely. It was just something I just happened to have close by. <laughs> and um, uh, shit, but uh, no, we're we're gonna do that. We're gonna put the show together, and when we, me and her work can get everything, and and also I'm trying to find a building uh, that I can actually set up as a studio and a storage area, and that way I don't have to fuck with setting up my shows. I can just go there, film everything. Um, and then everybody won't think that that they're like, oh, you filmed that at your shop. I'm like, no, that's just my room, with all my junk in it. But, hey, but you know, it's my junk, and I earned it. Mm -hmm. so it's, um, but I I gotta ask because I've I've asked this of everybody, and and I think I missed this the first time I talked to you guys. What is your go to movie? that when you talk to people for the first time, you tell them that this is the movie they need to watch. Um, like someone who never like. Someone who doesn't know you, you've got to tell them like you're, you're like your movie that you love that, that it, it will, um, they will associate you with that movie from then on. If they want to get to know you, they got to know that movie. I think for me, that's probably inadvertently Scream. 
a lot of people think of me when they think of that movie. I could see that. Wait, maybe I'm... Okay, so it's not a movie that we made. Not a movie you've made. Okay. I'm fine with the Monster Squad or Critters. One of those. I thought it would be Behind the Green Door. I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's a very legendary mainstream porn film from the 70s. <laughs> yeah, because it was uh, it was well, almost immediately after Deep Throat, that movie hit big. Mm -hmm. if I remember right. I, is that I, Marilyn was, Chambers? I yeah yeah because uh, they brought her because they made a big deal because they had the um, what she was Purex or something like that girl or something like that when she was a baby mm -hmm. and they made a big deal about having the pure girl be in the movie so so I, I I've I've got I've got to ask this too it's been a while so I've got to change I gotta um money's no object. You can hire whoever you want for these two movies you're working on. Who are you hiring? Wow. Um, That's kind of fucked up to ask me because that means I'm out of a job. No, it doesn't mean that you're out of a job. That means somebody else is out of a job. <laughs> No, you can um, bring them in for anything. You can make a whole new character for that person. I don't know. I feel like I can put D.B. Sweeney somewhere in there. Uh, <laughs> um, I would have to say for the devil you know, I really saw like in my head like for the bad guy, someone along the lines of like just lost his fucking name. It was there. What movies has he been in? This is Sparta. Oh, Gerard Butler. Gerard Butler. Uh, I had like a guy kind of like him, but meaner. Like meaner than you've ever seen Gerard Butler be. I, I loved him at Cop Shop if you haven't seen that. It's on, it's on Peacock. It's a throwback to like an 80s um, action movie type thing. It's pretty fun. I enjoyed the hell out of it. So. Ryan, your turn. Nobody? I can't speak to this. No, I can't speak to this because like I... Okay, okay. So for your next movie, you can hire anybody. Who 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 are you hiring? I I need to know the answer to this because we have gone through so many people for like starlets to where it may, if he can only choose one, Linda Hamilton. Linda Hamilton. I really liked Linda Hamilton. Because she went from being the love interest in Beauty and the Beast to being the badass in Terminator 2 in a very short amount of time. And that was... that That is a massive range right there. Uh, and I also love her on Resident Alien, if you haven't watched her on that. I just think she's super cool and just one of those people that is really undervalued what she can do and i, I tell you <laughs> so yep linda <laughs> hamilton is my choice hands down linda hamilton good choice mm -hmm. um so with 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 putting out these movies working on everything um the fact that you've done project mothman how, how much of project mothman do you have done percentage wise do you believe i feel like we have it changes every time I talk about this, but I feel comfortable at saying 70%. Because really, I think we have about four days of filming left at max. Ooh. 
now do you, do you I, I does this give anything i don't if this gives anything away just tell me now what we'll, we'll, uh do you have the full do you have a mothman costume we are in the process of building it because that's the thing at first um i had one way that i was going to go about filming mothman and mothman was going to be more i don't want to say paranormal or supernatural but like it was something that kind of got in your head to where you didn't see like a full embodiment of of Mothman. And a lot of that had to do with, I mean, like budget. It's cool. like not everybody can afford to make a seven foot tall Mothman suit. Well, the, 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 the I know this is bad, but I always like from going back and watching these old documentaries on Mothman and stuff like that, I think the humanoid shape with the glowing red eyes, where it's almost always black, with just mm -hmm. like the, the the kind of the silhouette with the black with just the burning red eyes. I thought that's creepier than any monster that you could have because, to be honest, Mothman could be very goofy looking. If, because I mean, yeah, I've seen ones that look really, really good, and then I've seen ones where you're just like, oh, that's a Power Ranger villain. That's, like, and and that's the, I mean, that's the best explanation of this character. I'm like, wow, somebody just stole some costumes from the Power Rangers and made a Mothman costume. The costume in the Mothman Museum, the one that you always see in photos and whatnot. That is the perfect way of describing it. It looks like a Power Rangers villain. To wear like, no, this suit, like, it's got feathers, it's got some fur, it's got some just creepy skin. It's... It was really hard because there are so many variations of Mothman. Like, yeah. some Mothman has a beak. Sometimes it doesn't to where it's like I I've known from day one I didn't want it to have a mouth. Like I just I just feel a mouth could be done in the wrong way and it just come off comical. Yeah. I to where it's yeah, I want to really play to the red glowing eyes. But there's a couple points to where because, I mean, this does get to be found footage to where, like, for example, um, somebody trips and drops their camera and the camera rolls. And, like, you can see the person, they reach for the camera. As they reach for the camera, like, literally, like, leaves on the ground start to fly as you hear wings come in. And you see, like, feet grab this guy and pull him up. And then it goes to the camera's point of view as he's getting drug up or flying, blown away. And then he drops the camera. So it's like, we're trying to play as much into practical as we possibly can. Like... Because I feel like any any more CGI and special effects like that, literally, there's websites that I could go buy a Mothman that looks awesome and have somebody 3D rig it to where it can move however I want it to and everything. If you want to spend like two grand to do that, I mean, that's an option. But I just... Yeah, I, my, there's something in it physically building and being a part of that building process it's like like you were talking earlier it's more about the passion mm -hmm. I'm not trying to make some gimmicky thing with some CGI bastard to just try to make some money like yeah. I care about Mothman like <laughs> as weird as that says to say out loud but it's like I want this to be a good representation because there aren't many 
Mothman movies out there. There, there there's not. I mean, there's quite a few documentaries. <clears throat> right. There's very few horror movies um, that that have the, that have the Mothman in them. And there's. I just watched one week, two weeks ago, maybe. And you never see the monster at all. And um, it's, it's Mothman something. It's I, I want to say it, it's was either it was one of the ones that was on Plex or Tubi, like I said. Um, and you never see the monster. You see the eyes and then people disappearing, you know, whatever. But yeah, that can be scary. But I think you need to at least see most of the monster once. You know right, what I'm like, saying? We, we I can tell you that there's there's one shot in this that you will see full on Mothman, and our actor is on stilts, so it's gonna go from being low to raise up. So you're gonna see it go from like five to seven feet, like, and it's gonna be kind of intimidating. Like, yeah, it's, oh, I can't wait. <laughs> Um, is, now, is is that uh, a big chunk of what you're raising money for, is to build the suit? Between building the suit and, I mean, granted, it's, it's only a weekend, but the location cost and then feeding everybody, like, a lot of people don't realize this, but a huge chunk of a budget is just feeding people. Okay. I mean, well, you're looking at between, depending on like depending on how you want to treat your people <laughs> you're looking at anywhere between two to four grand in just like a week-long shoot of just food yeah um somebody told me that it's they figure they figure one-fifth of your budget is just to feed your cast and i was like that's a lot and he's like no it's not when you think about it because you know when you got 20 people or whatever and you're feeding them three meals a day even even two meals a day that adds up quickly and I'm like, right yeah yeah it does you got to have somebody who's preparing that food like because oh, yeah. it you know depending on what it is it's not like you can just end shooting early to go make some food oh yeah you're going to pay somebody to be on set to be cooking dinner while you're over there filming they're cooking and right. yeah so uh or, or you just do the buffet way so you get lots of pasta and chicken lots of pasta and chicken <laughs> don't get me wrong there's normally some pre-made like meals in big aluminum tins and whatnot yeah. that would reheat but yeah I, i'd say my my best experience with that was on uh don't fuck in the woods too. I think it was about twenty three hundred dollars, and we were shooting for a week, and basically, uh, we shot at a campground, and they had a kitchen there. They prepared everything. They just said, "Hey, let us know what times you want to eat each day, and we'll have your your meal ready." That was that was awesome. That was the closest I've felt to being on like a major motion picture. <laughs> so uh that that's that's gotta be, you know, because I couldn't imagine trying to put together a movie. You know, I'll write stuff and I'll put stuff together and I'll plan out things, but like I could you know, I wouldn't even think about oh I gotta feed the people today. Oh I gotta <laughs> Everybody be showing up. I'm like, we're gonna film this movie, and then you know, like four hour, five, six, seven hours in, they're like, are we getting food? What now? Oh shit, right. you guys want to eat? <laughs> right, and I'm one of those people. Like, I can go with eating like once a day, to where it's like, if I'm in, if I'm like invested in something, I'm not worried about eating. So I tell everybody, like, listen, bring snacks, just. Bring snacks. If you need a pick me up, you know, we'll do that because if if good things are happening, it, it's a it just really sucks to have to stop. I, 
I was going to ask you about that. That would have to be hard to walk away when you really got a scene going or you got really got everybody in, in the zone and you're just, and then all of a sudden it's like, man, we should stop and eat. Do you want to stop and eat or do you just keep going because you're in the zone? You just, you know, people are really got their character down pat that day and everything else like right. that. You're like, Hey, walk over and eat a power bar, get an energy drink and be back. <laughs> Uh, the I, with, with putting all these movies together with I mean you guys just had your anniversary recently right at your 15 years that's pretty we're, damn we're, I think you're gotta be like 17 oh, or we're 12 now 12 okay so you had your 10th anniversary a while back and your 10 yeah. that's that's a lot. And you guys have put out a lot of material in a, in essentially a relatively short amount of time. But, uh, there was a it, while there to where it, we were on a roll. We, we were just, oh, yeah. for sure. Cause I remember, um, uh, Midsummer's Nightmare, watch this, uh, Legend. Yeah, uh, I want to see. We did like five or six films in like what a like, three-year period. Yeah, you guys are pounding them out there for a while. <laughs> and and I, I gotta ask, do you guys ever have problems? Like, I know everybody wants to be in movies, and. This is the one thing I run into because I'm like, oh, I want to, I want to put a movie together. Of course, you have everybody that comes out of the woodwork. I'll be in your movie, dude. You can't act like you're sober, <laughs> so I don't want. It. And uh, I hate to say this, I had, I had a, a um, one friend, and he was like, I could be in your movie. I'm like, no, w why not? I'm like, <laughs> I. I I, I don't have a part for you. And I didn't want to be mean and be like, dude, I, I, you can't act like that. <laughs> you know, you, you can't be left alone for five seconds, more or less trying to be another, another person for five minutes. So, um, and, and I, do you, uh, and I got to ask this because I've seen this recently with, just so many people putting out movies right now or working on movies right now. Are you having any problems with just getting talent? Period. Nope. I don't feel like talent's really been an issue. Um, or, or, I mean, I guess not talent so much, but just the people to work on it, like your special effects people or, um, you know, costumes and stuff like that. Because I, I mean, I've talked a good to a couple special people guy is or person is uh hard to find um but i feel like at, over the last probably five years we've we've gotten to where we we found people that we know that not only we rely on but put out good qualities no i've ta i've talked to some other people about this um if you're a director and you work with the same people over and over and over again, um, does it ever feel like that they uh, um, people get used to those people in your movies so they know what that character is going to be? Do you try to move away from that? Do you try to like, okay, well, this I want to, I want to, yes, I love you. You're a great person. I want to, I don't want to put you in this movie. You know, or anything like that, because you don't want to oversaturate with uh, the same people over and over again. Is I've I've noticed that, and I, I know it's bad, but legitimately, while I'm I, I do stuff at night, and while I'm editing or stuff, I got I'll leave movies on, or while I'm reading, I'll leave a movie on, and I see these low budget movies. And you see the same, like, two people, it's usually the guy and the girl, roughly playing the same character in a lot of movies. And you're like, 
and I looked and I'm like, okay, okay, that movie was directed by the same guy, but that movie wasn't directed by the same guy. But yet the two people are pretty much the exact same characters in every movie they're in. Do you, do you ever, I mean, do you ever worry about that? Just, I mean, no. no. <laughs> And 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 I've said this before, but but man, we're in a pretty talent filled area, and strictly with with the amount of of low budget horror movies and stuff like that, and the actors and actresses, um, you know, you Ryan, you work a lot with Brittany, and she's really good, Blanton, and um, um, uh, she uh, when she played Carrie, um. Yes, I have yeah. worked with Miss Blanton a few times. Yeah. But I think Sean has actually worked with her more. Okay. It's it, it, I want to say it because it was literally like the last thing I watched was No, no, I yeah. I understand what you're saying. It's like but I know for me when I use someone that I have worked with in the past it's generally because I know what I can get from them as a director, to an actor, and so it's it goes beyond reliability. It's more I know that they're going to do their research and figure out their character and show up. And so, no, I don't feel like, at least for me, when this company has <clears throat> um, brought back people from previous projects to work either in a mix or together again, um, I don't feel like they're hitting replay at all playing similar characters but i can't speak to like what they do outside of their work for us okay because like i said it's 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 not i'm not putting anybody down. i don't want to put nobody down no. i don't want to put and like i said it's it's nobody that i've seen locally it's it's seeing low budget movies and you'll see you, you'll you'll start noticing the same actors and actresses popping up here and there and i know it's bad but um, well, paul you should also try to think about like maybe the region the movies were made in yeah, that's true like so you know we're in ohio so we're going to kind of be within that network of the like columbus and cincy film scenes mm-hmm doesn't seem like there's really much of one in Cincinnati per se. It's more across the river into northern Kentucky where there's more of a film scene and western Kentucky. So, you know, just think about the region. Like, if you see, for instance, maybe like Jason Crow and a few things, chances are those movies were made in the Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio region. Okay. Is that fair to say, Sean? Yeah. So it might not be a matter of people are just getting overused. It's literally a matter of geography. That's true. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, you only have, we're, we're in a small, yes, there's a lot of people here making films, but there's a small area because we're not that populated. Yeah. So it, it's, and it's, 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 it, it, you know, it goes kind of circles back to budget. Well, if you want to work with somebody else who's from a further distance away, well, then that's usually going to involve airfare. And so it goes into a grander scale of bringing somebody in. There are so many lovely talents that I know personally that I want to work with all the time. But, you know, they live in Los Angeles. And their time is very valuable to me. So lining up a schedule find somebody from the West Coast to come out and fuck around on one of our sets for a couple of days, that's a lot of money for how little they're needed. Yeah. Now, and so it, it, that's a question of the money, like, oh gosh, you know, am I spending this money right or does it need to be somebody else and that remainder be redistributed for the better of the budget? Understandable. Completely understandable. Now, do, do you guys ever look for talent like, uh, um, I know this is bad as bad as I didn't even know these existed. Well, I guess I didn't. I can't say I did not know they existed. Um, but I did an interview with an actress and uh, um, 
went to her page, found her uh, sizzle reel, whatever you want to call it now. And I'm like, oh, do you, do you ever actively like look, go out and look at any of those? Or do you just. I see them if they're sent to me mm. or if I'm looking at an actor and I'm just like YouTubing them just to see if there is a trailer or a scene from something they've done. Not okay. everybody has like a, not everybody has a demo reel. Not everyone has one. Um, that, that because like with something. this digital age, like I, mean, I think if you're going through the process, the casting process, it's good to have one. Um, yeah. I know you definitely need one at a more larger mainstream level mm -hmm. but um most of the people that submit to us they don't have demo reels they'll just send trailers they'll send clips that they've either been given or i've had people send me clips that they take of their work with their phone on a tv um or you know there's no video um like that it's either an audition or you know it's it, the casting process is different, I think, for us because I don't look for all that stuff specifically. And chances are, if I'm looking at someone, I've seen them in something before. Now, I, I got to ask you because uh, somebody pointed this out um, to me because I, I don't, I'm not out to act or anything. Um, but they're like, you know, people might go after you because, you know, I do talk to actors, actresses, I talk to writers directors i talk to all these people like that and then i do my other shows i have a built-in audience that i have a built-in uh um i guess i got a brand is what i think what they said mm -hmm. i'm like is that even a thing that you would even look at i mean yeah i mean i don't i don't know oh, if yes. that was what Sorry, yes. I missed it. Yes, okay. Because that is something that's taken into consideration. Like, we have met people along the way who have auditioned for things that were definitely uh, higher profile projects. And um, I know specifically of one person who had auditioned um, years ago for American Horror Story, and they didn't get the part because they didn't have enough presence on social media to bring attention to this show. Yeah. It's and it's like the person wasn't even being eyed for a long-term stint on the show. I do believe it was like one episode, but I'm just saying that casting directors now have to take that stuff into consideration. Like, how much more traffic are we going to get online with this person's presence? Okay. So it's all the, about likes, is... clicks, shares. Okay. So I, I didn't know if it was like kind of like bullshit or not, but yeah, that, that explains a lot. I mean, yeah, I, I kind of get seeing the power of social media right now with, um, and, you know, he should speak on this because it definitely is an issue that he is personally seeing. But we've had it before where <laughs> suppression software on social media really mutes his flow when they know that he's crowdfunding. And right now, it's just been suspiciously low stream counts for him. Hmm. Like, when he's going live to talk about his project, he's not getting the touch, the reach that he used to hmm. or that he normally does. Like, I think sometimes Sean can just pop on Facebook just to pop on Facebook and he'll have a decent little chat with people and they'll be on there talking with him for a little bit. But since he goes on and crowdfunds, then it's like three, four people are finding out that he's live and it's the same three or four people. Yeah. Okay. It's, I, I've, I've become... Um, I, I talked to Don Farmer um, a couple months back and he was explaining to me a lot of stuff. That, I mean, that I didn't even think about, you know, like 
name placement on video on on uh dvds and how you want the the everything to size up and everything i'm like because we were joking around because he had shark exorcist i was like why wasn't it the shark exorcist he said because it wouldn't have fit properly on the dvd case and i went really and he's like yeah because you, you you want it this way you want the font to be x amount of size and you want the picture to be so big and i'm like he goes you want to be able to see it from a row over if you're standing one row over you look over and you can see it on the shelf that's what you want to be able to do and i'm like son of a bitch i never thought about that but he was talking about you know bringing in people that that have a little bit of a name or have this or that and i'm like oh okay i didn't think about that and like I said, with being, uh, a, you know, a horror host, I've seen other horror hosts and stuff like that now getting jobs in horror movies because they supposedly have a built-in uh, market. They have a built-in audience. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, like, I guess that makes sense. And then um, you talk about being a social media presence. Um, I know that I... I I seen there was a wrestler that got a chance at being a world champion and he didn't have a big enough Twitter following. So basically he was a, he was a champ for like a minute. And then they brought in somebody who had had, you know, a million followers instead of 10,000 followers, even though that 10,000, the guy with 10,000 followers is a far better wrestler than the guy with a million followers. <laughs> so Although, if anybody looks at my Facebook, my Twitter, or Instagram, I don't have a whole lot. And you look at my YouTube, I got a shit ton of people that watch my shows. <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that it's like, there's so much that a lot of people don't think of that go into to indie filmmaking. Because indie filmmakers, we have to be all of it. We are the studio. We are the distributor. Like... We have to come up with, we got to have the artwork. We have to have the correct looking title or logo that we think are going to be pleasing to people. Then like we were talking about before, there's alpha stacking, like with deciding what your title is going to be. Yeah, there are like a hundred different things that go into like one decision. Hmm. And it's just, sometimes it can be, it can, it can be overwhelming. There's times to where, like, man, anymore, if it gets to, to the point where something is overwhelming or anything, um, I, I'll just sleep or I'll do dishes. I'm, I'm weird like that. If I have to process something, I need to clean or, or like, do dishes, and it helps me just... I think more rationally think of how I'm going to go about things. But if I've hit a wall and it's like, it, it's almost like depression. It's like, I'm going to go sleep and hopefully wake up to something better. But the, the, it's, it's the amount of, of decision-making and work that I did, didn't realize until recently. Like you said, with, with the alpha stacking and stuff like that, with the, the names and uh, um, damn, um, Betsy, that you just did, you had to change the name for, uh, uh, was it DVD release or uh, streaming release? Um, just, we had to change it in title, we, in, in, or uh, entirely, because the first time it was released, that distro company, A, didn't put out physical media, um, but they did streaming. And you can still find it on one or two sites as Betsy. Mm -hmm. But when we got the rights back and got new distribution, um, yeah, they were like, you know, we'll have to change the title. And I was like, I'm fine with that. And I wanted to find a title that would be appropriate for it. Like, there were a lot of titles thrown out and I don't I didn't really take alpha stacking into consideration because well the, that wasn't getting in red box or not a lot of places do alphabetical not media. anymore it, not even Walmart alpha so stacking kind of gone out the door um 
but yeah, with with Betsy, I just wanted a name that would still fit. Like I could have chose anything. I could have chose fucking the werewolf of Brookhaven or just something crazy that really didn't have anything to do with the movie, but would catch people's eyes and be like, Yeah, werewolf. I like werewolves. So well, it, it's like I said, it's it's a bunch of decision making that that I really did not un, did not know about until recently, and now I'm talking to you guys about it, and it's 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 really something that I was, you know, like I said, I should have been aware. I I managed a video store; it should have been something. But I also managed a Hollywood video. They tell you where shit goes, and they tell you it's not that I ordered anything; they just shipped it to us. Um, we had no decision making process there, even though we got screeners, we got screeners. I don't know why, because we didn't do anything with them. I had a shit ton of them at one point, but <laughs> um so I guess, I guess we'll, we've been going for a while here. I don't want to keep you guys too much longer. Um so where can people go to help you with funding your movies? Indiegogo. <laughs> I know. I, I gotta tell everybody. Uh, where can people go stream their movies, and where can they buy your movies? Um, a lot of a lot of our stuff is on Tubi or Amazon right now, um, streaming um, for physical copies. I would say, depending mm -hmm. on the title, between Amazon, uh, uh, conceptmediallc.com. See, I'm, I'm not gonna lie. This is how I knew you guys were starting to make it big. I bought a guy's uh, huge DVD collection about a year and a half ago, and in it was uh, two of your movies. <laughs> I was like, "All right," I was like, "Where'd you get these at?" Uh, I think he got one uh, at a flea market in Dayton, and the other one he got out of uh, Family Video. So. <laughs> think that's what he said but not 100 okay. but you know you make it big when they end up at my store in a box of stuff that I, I bought. There, there was one time in in dayton oh man what was that one big store called buybacks buybacks yeah we came across midsummer nightmares there once and that was that was the did they want like stupid money for it? Um, yeah, they wanted like fifteen bucks, I think. They were charging more for a used copy than we charged for a new one. That's what I was wondering. At any Buy point in time, was... that movie was out. Yeah. Buybacks was expensive. I don't know why anybody ever shopped there. Outside of maybe they paid good for their movies, I don't know. I never sold anything. There. Well. They had that. They had a room at the back that everything was a dollar, and then they had a part of that room that was just Blu-rays that were like two dollars, I think. And don't get me wrong, it was like some of the worst movies out there, but it was still it. <laughs> I would bring home because my kids lived down around that area, and every week I'd probably bring home. 20 movies from that dollar area see that that's that's me now i i buy all those movies that come through because i'm i might be the only place in piqua that's still outside of like walmart that still sells just dvds and for the most yeah. part they're a dollar all my dvds are a dollar for the most part, there's some out of print stuff that I still have that's never been released on DVD or on Blu-ray or whatever. And those are a little more expensive. Like I have like an $8, $10, whatever. Uh, Blu-rays for the most part. Let me know if five. you come across any copies of Spice World. Spice World? Uh, I think I have a VHS copy of it. At the store. <laughs> I'll double check and make sure it's got a because uh, I, I probably should check but VHS is a real bad because people put the wrong ones in and I'll double mm -hmm. check I, I did have one a while back I'll, I'll see if I did and if I do I'll, I'll pull it and you can have it same if I find a, a nice. DVD you can have it I... 
I've Wait, got what? a comic I'm looking for. Do what? I've got a comic I'm looking for. What you looking for? It's the giant size werewolf by night number four, where it's the werewolf versus Morbius. Okay. I I got some werewolf by nights, and I have some adventures in the fear. So I'd have to look. And I'm always uh, werewolf by nights that I don't have. See, I got I, I got a uh graded copy of a Marvel magazine, which is the first appearance of Blade fighting Morbius the Living Vampire. So I was like, oh, that happened in a Marvel magazine first. And they're like, yep. I was like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so I ended up with it. Ended up in trade. It wasn't even like something I, I set out to buy. I was like, ah, he owed me like 20 more bucks. I was like, why don't you throw that in on the deal? He's like, okay. And then I get home. I was like, it's a hundred dollar book. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> Is it going? And my kids are like, you want to sell it? I'm like, nah, it'll go over there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and and now and now I gotta tell and now now I'm going through that the whole thing because I'm getting older. So I'm like, I tell my wife and my kids, I'm like, remember, go through everything when I die. I was like, because there's expensive shit hidden everywhere in this room. And there's signed stuff. There's uh I have signed vinyl, signed books, signed posters. Um uh, I have all my helmets and shit like that. And I got arcade cabinets. And I told my wife, I was like, well, you can sell this shit off and pay the house off. So, but, um, uh, yeah. But no, uh, if you ever look at, uh, remind me, um, send me a message uh, on Facebook. And then I'll remember to look for it tomorrow. So I'll start digging through the stuff when I get there. If not probably right away, but relatively, you know, I'll see if I can find you. And I'll try to find your Try to find you some Spice World stuff. So, I, I just I, want a copy of the movie. I had you know, one. Um, Sean acquired it in his second divorce, and then somebody stole it from me. Somebody stole Spice World. Yeah, that is that is a, that is a villain right there that would steal Spice World. Well, that's because it's a hard movie to come by. What is it? Is it? it it's used an issue to... with all the music that's used in it. Yeah, it that's a lot of those movies that way. Yeah, because there, there's a. It hasn't um, been re, it has not been reprinted since its first DVD release, like over ten or twelve years ago. Dude, yeah, I think I think I have a copy, but it's Tina's copy, so technically I don't have a copy. I mean, <laughs> just steal it from her. It's fine. I'll deal with Tina. <laughs> to Tina. I, I took her to go see that in the theater and uh i'm not gonna lie man i had the i had the biggest crush on uh jerry oh my god she's cute but i i have a thing for well, her. paul i hate to jet out of this interview man but yep. i gotta go to the bathroom well i'm gonna so. wrap it up too because i gotta i gotta go get the dogs outside and everything so um thank you guys for coming on um you're welcome it's always fun. Uh, I love hanging out with you guys. Uh, we actually got to go hang out and do something sometime and go get something to eat or or you come up here and we'll go get Mexican or Chinese or Japanese or some shit like that and just have a day of it. So, because I, I, that's one of the things I love about going to Horror Hound because I usually see you guys. And then when I got there and you weren't there, I'm like, where's Ryan? It's like, he's on vacation. Yeah, like, you're on vacation. I'm like, well, fuck. <laughs> I wasn't on vacation. You said you were gone. I, I don't know where you were at, but. I would travel for work. That's it. You were so traveling. I got sent to the Pacific Northwest for 12 days, like very last minute, like the week before Horror Hound, I got told I was going. And I was offered to fly back for the convention, but then I would have had to fly back again for work and then come back again. So. Nope. Um, also, I don't know. Uh, I'm probably going to um, a horror convention, Haunted Screams Expo in September as a guest. Um, but I might get with you guys and take some of your stuff with me to help promote and all that fun stuff. Because I went last time and they're like, you didn't bring any merch. I'm like, I don't have any merch. I just really started this. Stuff. I was like, I don't have nothing. I don't have no t-shirts. I don't have no hats. I don't have nothing. Now I'm hopefully by then I'll have hats and t-shirts and shit. So 
Oh, cool. And now we'll get stupid shit with my face on it. So, but yeah, it's been great talking to you guys. Um, so one of these days, I will give you a shirt with my face on it. <laughs> it'll be it'll 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 say Saturday morning cereals, except for I'm making it look like a black metal shirt. So it'll say Saturday morning cereals, all like black metal font. And it will have me standing on like a, a a mound of TVs and cereal boxes with the corpse paint on and shit. <laughs> but I'll still be wearing the hat in the bathroom. Cool. So bathroom. Because <laughs> I'm Hell really yeah. into, I'm really into character when I do my character. Because they're like, that's lazy. I'm like, you're damn right, it's lazy. I film at like mm-hmm. one o'clock in the morning. I don't want to go in the bathroom, put <laughs> makeup on, put my gimmick on, and then come out. I just put my hat on, throw my bathrobe on. I I did. Ah, there it is. Ah, before you go, um, I tried to do an episode with this one, ah, and it's all right, it's gentlemen. A, I'll see you guys later. There it is. Ah, there it is. And <laughs> uh, uh, you cannot breathe with this thing on at all. So <laughs> I did like the first five seconds, and I was like. <gasps> We're not doing that. <laughs> but uh, all right. Well, sir, thank you for being on the show. Tell Ryan, thank you again. And uh, I'll talk to you guys. Like I said, we need to go do something, man. Go get something to eat. Freaking hang yeah. out. Bullshit. Free comic book day is coming up. So you can swing up on free comic book day and get some free comic books. Is that May in 4th? May? May 4th, I believe. I think it's right. First Saturday in May. I can tell you that much right there. So. Wonder, wonder and then a month after that. Pickle Comic Con. So, you doing anything June fourth? Um, we are supposed to be at a convention. Okay. Uh, May fourth is on day. I don't know. It's the first Saturday. I might be wrong on the day. Okay. I don't have a calendar. So, May sixth. I do have my kids. Um, we're supposed to be. Uh, Small Town Monsters is having. It's called Monster Fest in Canton, Ohio. Yep, I know. Um, I know a couple people that can't make it because they're going to be there. So that's yeah. At the moment, we have a booth there, but when when I got that booth, you know, it depends if Stranded is going to be out. Yeah, like if Stranded's out hitting a convention that's all about Bigfoot. Yep, that would be hopefully um, worth it. Ah, there it goes. Out of the box. That was back in the box. Sorry. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was driving me nuts. But um, yeah, no, just um, like I said, also anytime you want to come up to the shop or something like that. But yeah, I'll I'll put some comic books back for you. So okay. and I'll look for yours. So yeah, uh, I'm out of here. You're out of here. Go home or you're already at home. Chill out, relax <laughs> for the night. And <laughs> and uh I'm about to uh uh partake of some edibles and chill the fuck out for the rest of the night. <laughs> awesome <laughs> so, so have a good night man uh ryan if you can hear this have a good night <laughs> all right later man see y'all later bye all right we want to thank ryan and sean for being on the show tonight and as always group therapy tv is brought to you by are you game the best comic book collectible video game magic toy shop located at 124 north sunset drive pickle ohio 45356 and you can find me on youtube uh, twitter instagram uh facebook all that fun stuff so and you can find all those guys on facebook twitter instagram all that stuff too so take care and i'll see you all there captain out bye